The year is 1958. Our story begins at a research and manufacturing facility on the lonely plains of North Texas. Moo! Meet our hero, a gifted engineer from Kansas, Jack Kilby. Jack was a quiet man, a man of few words. Jack had just started at Texas Instruments as the newest member of the Semiconductor Development Lab. Hi, Jack. Hello, Jack. Welcome, Jack. It was summer, and all of TI's employees were going on vacation. Bye, Jack. See you, Jack. Later, Jack. Jack took advantage of the time alone to work on a new idea. Little did anyone know that Jack was on his way to developing one of the greatest inventions of the 20th century. Vacation was soon over, and when everyone returned, Jack presented his new idea. The integrated circuit. The what? The integrated circuit. Is that the same as a chip? Yes. Is that the same as a microchip? Yes. Is that the same as a miniaturized electronic circuit consisting mainly of semiconductor devices as well as passive components that have been manufactured in the surface of a thin substrate of a semiconductor material? Yes! Whatever you call it, Jack's invention led to the development of the handheld calculator, the personal computer, and the information revolution that would change the world. And now, the inventor of the integrated circuit, Jack Kilby. Thank you. Jack, you've got to say more than that. Thank you very much. If you look back to the first great wave of American innovation, I'm talking about Thomas Edison, Alexander Graham Bell, Henry Ford, engineers who changed the, the daily life of the world with a good idea, they were global heroes. Jack Kilby changed the daily life of the world just as spectacularly as Thomas Edison did and Henry Ford did, and nobody's ever heard of him. Jack was a Kansas boy. He was a real level-headed, uh, straightforward guy. He had his feet on the ground. He knew what he was doing. And the most unassuming person, probably the most unassuming Nobel laureate in the history of physics. I never realized that other people's dads couldn't fix the TV. And I have this memory of him with his head in the back of the opened up uh, television and my mom running for the circuit breaker, you know, afraid he's going to electrocute himself. And he's like, you know, I'm an electrical engineer. I, I, I think I can do this one okay. Texas Instruments started out as an oil exploration company, Geophysical Service Incorporated. The company actually was founded in New Jersey, but the work, the field crews, were in Oklahoma and Texas. It became very clear to the founders that if they were going to be an oil exploration company, they needed to come to the Southwest. In many ways, it was a match made in heaven for, for Dallas and for what becomes Texas Instruments because Dallas was a city on the go. Dallas was a city that was willing to take chances. Dallas bankers, for instance, embraced uh, the new company. So this was a company that was wedded to Dallas, certainly by the 1950s. There was a tremendous optimism and confidence in the economy for the 1950s, and folks bought that second car, they bought TVs. The transistor radio, which is a Texas Instrument invention, became very popular during this time. Texas Instruments becomes much more interested in electronics. They had the silicon transistor, which was a major accomplishment. Texas Instruments in Dallas was considered an outlaw. The sort of establishment elites in New York and Philadelphia and Boston said, whoa, those Texas cowboys, how could they get this? In the early 50s, you could design a computer that could do anything. You could design that, but they couldn't build it. 
And the reason was there were just too many separate parts that had to be wired together. Just the numbers of parts and connections were too great. And the common name for this problem was the tyranny of numbers. We can perceive of that device, but we can't build it because the numbers are too great. Jack Kilby was among engineers all over the world looking for a solution to this problem. TI had an annual vacation policy at the time where everybody clears out for two weeks during the summer. And my father had not been there long enough to earn this vacation. He had all this peace and quiet for two weeks. And it was during that time that he developed the concept of the microchip. Every computer at that time had miles and miles of wiring inside. And Jack said, why do we need the wires? If I make the parts all out of the same material, I could just carve them into one block of that material and no wires. This is a totally crazy idea. Nobody had ever thought of this before. Jack Kilby took the tyranny of numbers and reduced the number to one. One chip with all the parts on it and no wires. That was his solution. And once you did that, then you could put a computer in the nose cone of a rocket that could take you to the moon. Totally independently, Bob Noyce, who was at uh, Fairchild Electronics in California, hit on basically the same idea. Jack got it first. Uh, Bob Noyce, I think, was the first to come up with a practical way to manufacture it. Almost from the beginning, the two have been viewed as uh, co-inventors. As a junior in high school, I worked at Scarborough's department store. I sold books and electronics, and the big deal was we were one of the first stores to have this Texas Instruments, you know, calculating device. And I mean, and it was huge, and all it did was, you know, multiply, add, subtract, and divide. But that was a big deal. One of the things that tickles me about the first prototype for the handheld calculator is that the buttons are like this big because that's how, you know, that's how big his fingers were. And now, you know, you have to get a little pen or something, the point of it, to make a calculator work. The impact on the world of Jack Kilby's idea has been spectacular. If it weren't for the integrated circuit, Jack Kennedy's promise that we'll go to the moon in a decade couldn't have happened. It's a multi-trillion dollar industry. It employs billions and billions of people around the world. It's hard to think of any scientific or engineering breakthrough in the 20th century that had more impact on our lives than the microchip. My father had over 50 patents, but I believe his favorite invention was the chip because it was useful. He was a very practical person. He always said that everyone should make a contribution in life. And I think that that is what really powered his uh, inventiveness. Every time Jack got a prize, he said, well, I'm not worth all the fuss. Texas Instruments made him have a press conference the day he got the Nobel Prize. And the first thing he said was, I'm sure if Bob Noyce were alive, he'd be sharing this award. He didn't get it until 42 years after the invention. And I used to say to him, why didn't you get this prize? And he said, no, 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 Nobel Prizes, they're for scientists. They're for these guys, these deep thinkers with the big ideas. I'm just an engineer, you know, all I do is make ideas work. When he got that prize, <laughs> we were standing outside. I think Jack had his white tie and tails on, and I think they made him wear a top hat to this big fancy dinner. And uh, Jack's trying to hail a cab, you know. And, I, and uh, we said to him, Jack, no, they have a limo for you. I'm not worth the fuss. That, that was how he reacted to Nobel Prize. What did you do when you, when you got that call? Got up and made coffee. <laughs> Once a friend was teasing him and said that Jack had two speeches, a short speech and a long speech. The short speech was thank you, and the long speech was thank you very much. To learn more about the chip that Jack built, go to kera.org slash chip.
This film was made possible by the Summerlee Foundation and the valued support of KERA members. Thank you.